one thing that, that, that psychologists have discovered, and Tim Wilson and I were some of the first to work on this kind of question, is how much that goes on in our heads is unconscious. I mean, we, we think we know what's going on. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, Freud didn't know the half of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, m most of what goes on in our heads we have very little inkling of. Some of the work that's come out recently about um, um, these priming effects, trivial little things, embarrassing that we're affected by them. I mean, uh, you ask me to read a persuasive communication and you happen to have introduced a fishy smell into the room, I'm not as persuaded hmm. by it. Something's fishy here. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, Interesting. Literally. Yeah. It, it works, and we know that that's what's going on. It's the fishy thing, the metaphor. Because there are some countries that don't have the metaphor, that I'm something, I'm, there's, there's something fishy yeah, about that. So that's this. your control group, is it? So they don't that's experience right. it. That's right. There are some cultures that just don't have that. I mean, okay. in, in Denmark, so, I think it's I smell a rat. So. Oh, I gotcha. I, how, who knows what a rat <laughs> smells <laughs> like? I, mean, I don't know if there's rat essence that you can spray into the air. So then what's the upshot? So you're saying... So, yep, so a lot of it's unconscious. Yeah, um, a lot of, I mean, process, in terms of my definition, is always unconscious. There's no such thing as awareness of cognitive process. We claim it, but we don't claim that we have awareness of the, of the perceptual processes that we have. We have absolutely no idea mm -hmm. how these various sensations are getting treated. And, and when you teach it in psychology, what perception is like, virtually everything you tell people, they had no idea. I mean, a lot of, I mean, there are a million visual illusions, for example, which depend on the fact that we have certain perceptual processes that operate in a particular way, and if you give us something that's slightly off base from that, we make an error in it because the, the, the unconscious perceived procedures that we have for perceiving the world uh, will lead us astray in those situations. The thing I most want people to understand is that we, we solve problems. Everything from the most common everyday problem, like how do I make up my, to Joe after my unpleasantness to him, to how do I solve this professional problem that I'm dealing with. That, most of that goes on. First of all, there's no access to process at all. We know what's in our heads. Some of it, huge amounts, we don't know what's in our head. And the, the procedures that we use to solve problems um, are, uh, are often completely uh, opaque to us. We don't, we, just, we don't know how we did it. My favorite study like this that was ever done uh, was uh, in the 1930s. Um, a psychologist whose name was NRF Meyer uh, had people uh, do a, a problem, solve a problem. He had cords hanging from the ceiling in different places. Um, and he said, I want you to bring these cords together. And, and there were lots of things that were, there were, very, there were things lying all around the room. And something, something that they could use an extinction cord. So they tied the extinction cord to one of them, pulled it to the other, easy solution. Uh, and after they had five or six of these, then uh, he, there was one other way to do it that they hadn't yet discovered, which was much more difficult. And they'd been, after this, the subject had been stumped for five or ten minutes, uh, Meyer, who's been wandering around the room the whole time, flips one of the, uh, the cords, sets it into motion. Within 45 seconds, the typical subject tied something to the bottom of it, swung it like a pendulum, grabbed the other and tied them together. And Meyer says, that's great, that's the solution. How'd you come up with that? And no one ever gave him the answer, uh, and uh, the correct answer. And he ran some psychologists through this, and they were hilarious. I mean, in their rich accounts of what, I thought of monkeys swing, swinging through trees. The idea of a pendulum entered my head at the precise moment. <laughs> you have a slave who's working for you all the time. Uh, that's your unconscious. And we don't take nearly as much use of it as we could. You have to, there's a, a, a writer for the New Yorker who has a wonderful um, account of how, how, you, how you write, how to do it. 
So you have to sit down and think a bit about what you're going to do. If you, if you don't, nothing's going to happen. The next time you sit down, there's been, but if you, if you actually do that, spend a few minutes thinking about what the problem is, how, how you want to get this thing across. It's been handed over to the unconscious, and the unconscious is working on it 24 hours a day, no matter what you're doing. Uh, I mean, I find that with my own work all the time. I, when I'm teaching seminar, I give thought questions. If I wait until I, just before I have to do those thought questions, it's a, an effort, they're not very good. If three or four days in advance, I said, what are the best things that I want to make sure come out of the discussion here? Uh, and just spend five or ten minutes on it. Three days later when I start to do it, it's like I'm taking it by dictation. And they're much better than I would otherwise have come up with. I don't know that I've ever convinced any students. For that term paper, first day of class, tomorrow start working on that term paper. Yeah. And I don't think they believe me. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever gotten across. But I, uh, I, do, I have a lot of examples now of this kind of thing. And I think if you spent 20 or 30 minutes with people, they might really come to believe you and might be able to make much more use of their brain than they are.